agenda to this evening. Uh, it's not actually an action item, but when uh, we get to the policy section of the agenda, um, in our last meeting, there were a number of questions regarding the substitute teacher policy, GCTA. And although that's not directly on the agenda, Georgia does have some information about the um, scale at which various people who are subbing in the building are being paid. And I thought you'd want that as a couple of Can I have a motion for approval of the minutes of our March 18th meeting? Okay, motion by Kayla. Can I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Amber. Uh, is there any discussion or comment? Any changes? None. All those in favor? Any objections? Okay, at this point, it's time for public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make comment to the Seeing none, we'll no. move. We'll move on. <laughs> uh, we have two presentations this evening. Three, actually. So that's pretty exciting. We're going to start with Doris Mitchell. She is within grade three and five, and she's going to be talking to us about what they've been doing with their early release time at those grade levels. Thank you so much, Doris. Well, um, first of all, I want you to know that first slide up there, I all the others by cohort um, Bridget Wharton did. You'll definitely see a difference. However, for those of you who had me in school, you'll see I graduated a little bit from the overhead projector and the chalkboard. So um, anyway, the first three slides are about why we chose the topics that we chose to, to study, and the rest of them are, on, are about um, how we went about it. And a couple of reasons why is um, we chose to look at reading, uh, to take a closer look at reading and reading curriculum. And one of the reasons is that um, districts around the country have been doing this as well. And there, uh, have, we have seen reports like there's a mismatch happening between some of the reading curriculums and some of the reading that's coming out from the tests. We also knew that K2 was also looking at reading and the science of reading. It makes sense for us to go um, and look at reading itself. So, one of the questions that we thought about was our publishers and reading curriculum and the best practices of reading instruction are they uh, Let's see. So, can you go to the next slide? Sure. <coughs> also, um, due to the pandemic, um, kids coming into our classroom, we saw firsthand far more reading levels than we had in the past in our classroom that we needed to deal with. So we wanted to make sure that we had uh, appropriate materials in order to meet that need. So we got to work. Okay. Um, we started by looking at curriculum that was provided, some provided us uh, a list of curriculum that was used in the, the area schools. And so we'll, we'll just start there. We'll look at that. So we can go to the next slide. Sure. So um, we, we started there and then we realized, wait a minute, we get to make some benchmarks for us from grades three through five. So the first way was spent creating reading benchmarks so that, um, we would, so that when assessments transfer between teachers, we have common dialogue to talk about. And as you can see there at grades three, four, and five, um, we've got benchmarks for reading A to Z, DRAs, Rickies, um, Fountain of Excel, Julia, and Reading Book. So there's a lot of data there that we could use. So the next thing is that we created a list of different reading programs. And as we started thinking through the reading programs, we realized that not all of them were reading curriculum. Some were reading curriculum and some were supplemental materials. So the first thing we did is that we divided the two in half. And then we took 
the um, curriculum laying up among our team, and we talked about, okay, what are we going to look at? And we looked, we wanted to look for curriculums that had strong phonics, had an intervention piece, and online remote options, and you can see all the other things there, up there, that we wanted to look at. Yeah. So we set to work, and we divided them up. We compared each curriculum to um, some research from Ed Reports and Learning List. And Ed Reports is an independent nonprofit, and their sole mission is to help improve K-12 education. So if you look up there, you can see green is good to go. They um, rate them in text quality, usability, building knowledge, and foundational skills. Um, yellow is medium, and of course the red is not so good. Um, so through our research, we can go to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We found that some of the, the things out there that were kind of like brand name kind of things, um, we're not rated as highly as we thought they would be. But these are the things that, one of the things that we found, um, curriculum that does follow the science of, science of reading and the common core. This con was core knowledge, reading AZ, journeys, wonders, the American Reading Company, micro literacy, and written wisdom. Not that we're gonna adopt all those, but it does give us a place to start. Um, we also found some really good supplemental <coughs> materials out there. So those are listed as well. Let me go to the next one. Oh, there we go. Uh, we also know um, one of the things that we looked at is that phonics and morphology instruction should continue in grade three through five. Um, and a lot of curriculum didn't have that piece. So that was one of the things that we really found as we looked at different curriculum. And that's one of the things that we really wanted and felt was needed in our certain situation. So anyway, last but not least, thank you much, so much for that talk. It really was beneficial. Um, we would probably still be working on this this year and probably even next year um, if we hadn't had that time. So we appreciate it. <laughs> Very nice story. Well, thank you, Mrs. Mitchell, for that presentation. Sure. Uh, the question I had was it looked like you did a lot of that stuff with Excel spreadsheets and all of that, um, mapping out the pros and cons and all that there. Uh, when you anticipate your group will then do another evaluation, would you set a timeline to say every two years, every four years? No, we didn't, we didn't set a timeline. We're at the next steps, well, we're going to get with K through two because they have been doing some things in the South. Compare notes um, and kind of make a plan as to where we're going to go from here. We did star a couple of the, the curricula and a couple of the supplemental materials that for 335 we felt were uh, most beneficial and seemed to fit. And we're going to share that with the K through two team. And, like I said, make a plan. Great, I think it'll help them out to reinvent the wheel, especially I like your theological process you went through to kind of weigh things out. I think that that was good. And uh, I think those are good resources to have access to when, when it comes time to go through because there's new stuff every year, right? Absolutely, yeah. There's yeah. new stuff every so year. And companies it's always go out of business, new companies yeah. come along. So. Yeah. I think, it, I think it was well done. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank the team. Um, but three through five, K through two, have been working extremely hard on this. And then Chris's question, they're still like in the beginning stage. They've got like all their options are on the table and they meet with K through two. If we're going to have a good product for what we're going to use coming out of it. And in meetings with other schools, it's coming up a lot of what are you guys using for reading? What do you, because they're finding like, this can curriculum, these big curriculums, it's big business, you know, and I think they're finding you spend the money, you're not always getting the results. And I think we might arrive at something more that we create, you know, like some that we generate, we borrow a lot of resources to align with the science reading. So thank you, Doris, as we have a great start and Shelly's team will present in May, they'll kind of tie it together, be more work done. So yeah.
Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Also, the um, how, what's the intent to try to do the vertical alignment with that? Is it going to be at each group does their sections and then try to figure out based on some continuities if you figure out a core curriculum that you can, you can pull through either maybe K2 to 3.5 and then another section that's 3.5 up to the middle school type of thing. So there's some continuity for the... Yeah, so right now with their, their vertical team in K through five, and that's going to kind of set our base. And then we'll start pulling up to middle school and high school. And, and teachers, it's kind of nice, actually. You know, we're coming out of all of this. And I'm starting to get my first requests again from people to say, hey, can we have a Tuesday to vertical team because of all the stuff we've been going through? So, yeah, that will be like the next phase. Get the base set and then start looking up into it. Um, will we get kind of an update on how this is for our students? Like, say, in a year or so? Yeah, you know, we'll keep you updated. Usually there's a couple years before you see the implementation shift. You, sometimes you have a dip at first, an implementation dip. And then, so yeah, you know, year, two years, three years, five years, you know, is when you really start seeing that change. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like, as we discussed for the policy, like if once they decide on something, that will come to you for presentation for your seal of approval to yes, let's move forward in this program. So. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Move on to the high school presentation then. And I can't believe you spoke. I wish I knew this myself. John and I think we had to pay your back today. <laughs> <laughs> That's just going to be hard. They're pretty good. See if it works in action. I hope my uh, stand up table works. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Cheese, dude. All right. So the high school team never has enough hours. We don't have a common prep. We don't ever all get to sit down together except for that, you know, an hour and a half on Tuesdays. So this ski Tuesday time was so important for us. We get so much work done. You know, there's, you know, there's always that checklist of nuts and bolts of you know how can we get all this done? Well, let's push that to next week. We didn't get to it this week. Um, and we were able to check off some of those things. So that was really exciting for us. We met as a team with Sean first to go over the ins and outs of the website. Um, we wanted to know how to format ours, how to link them up to the school website. Um, the goal is for our sites to be living documents, right? We want to be transparent to the community. We want the community to be able to look at our websites and know who we are and what we're doing. We want prospective families to be able to come in from the outside and say, what classes do you offer here? Let's check the website, right? We didn't have that in every content area. Um, Matt didn't have one at all. Not that I'm pointing any fingers at people. <laughs> <Matt Richard>. um, <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Um, so this is my website that I created. It's got a little blurb about myself. My classroom rule is just be respectful. Um, and then just a few little things. These objectives were pulled right from the program of studies, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, you can see here I have like our course offerings. So you, anyone can click here, come in, and then you know they can uh, get a little glimpse of my sense of humor and see all my favorite math memes. There we go. Um, this is Miss Woodman's. It's just a screenshot. You can see she also has hyperlinks to her um, content areas for her subject. They all look a little different. Some are a little further along at this point than others, but we're really working hard to make sure that it is a good reflection of what's happening in our building. We also spent time on program of studies. As Seth mentioned, these curriculum things are going to come to the board. Um, and our program of studies wasn't ready for you. So we spent time. We updated all of our courses. We met with the administration. And we prepared it for the formatting and presentation to you guys. Um, it is now ready for final formatting, final editing, you know, all the fancy nuts and bolts, hyperlinking, all that fun stuff. And then ultimately, I believe the goal is to get that accessible to everyone. So the second nuts and bolts thing we did was rethinking. Sorry, this is not nuts and bolts. This is a big step. Um, after the website's and program of studies, there were two big ticket items that we needed to spend our time on. The first one is wind tech. 
If you don't know what wait time is, because you're not in the high school wing every day with us, it's a 30 minute block of time after lunch. It's called What I Need. It was originally intended to be a study hall, a chance for teachers and students to meet, say that student has a study hall when I have a class and I can't meet with them. Um, it was a time for interventions. It was a time for any class meetings or any business items that needed to do with students. Over time, as you can imagine, maybe with high school students, it got a little loose. Things kind of fell apart a little bit. I don't need that study hall. I'm gonna go over here and chat with my friends. So we didn't feel like it was being used very effectively. Um, and you combine that with the need for kids to have intervention time. We have students in our high school who are struggling. We need time to meet with them. We need time to give them organizational skills, you know, help them make a checklist of what they're missing, what's their priority. You know, we don't get time for that necessarily throughout the day. So having a set time to be able to meet with those kids is really important for us. So we put into place with Richmond Wednesdays. So any student on a, Wednesday, on a Monday morning that's below a 70 in any class, the 70s passive, gets assigned to an intervention with Ms. Silver. So Wednesday afternoon after lunch, they go right to Ms. Silver's room, they meet with her, she goes through the power school, they look at their assignments, they run down a checklist, how can I get organized, what, are, what do I need to do? Everyone else, has an option. They can go to the gym for half an hour. They can go to arts and crafts and board games. They can have a study hall if they need a study hall. They can have a class meeting. They can have student council. So there's this time where we can meet with kids we need to meet with, but also we expect kids to sit in the classroom all day long. And we forget sometimes that we have kids that need to move. You can see right here, I put a screenshot of our gym sign up. It is full every single week. These kids want to go spend half an hour playing volleyball in the gym, you know, kick a soccer ball around. They want to get out of the classroom, and we forget that sometimes. Um, in our enrichment in the third quarter, Sonia had kids sewing, um, crocheting, knitting. They made Valentines for the senior citizens. You know, they did some really fun stuff. Uh, she's focusing a little more on her AP art stuff from here on in, so we're switching that to. Uh, crafts in this women's room, but we're still operating. The kids are having fun. They get to do something different. And it's motivating them to keep their grades above 70. They don't have to go to intervention. <clears throat> the second big ticket item that we had to tackle was the project. So I came to you guys in January, and I told you all about the amazing progress we made on this project. We stuck with the theme of food. The second phase as I mentioned, is student-driven, student-centered, student-driven, student-focused, right? In the first semester, we kind of presented all of this and had guest speakers, and we picked field trips, and we chose things for them to do. Now the kids brainstormed, said, stick with the theme of food, and brainstorm. What do you want to do? What can you bring to the community, to the school, to your own life? What kind of projects do you want to work as individuals and in small groups? Overwhelmingly, they wanted to work in small groups. So we had brainstorming sessions. And we ended up in seven groups. We even got Mr. L to take on a group that was interested in hunting and foraging. Um, I think they went outside today and had some fun in the outdoors. So these are our final seven groups. All the groups are at different places. We each have a lead teacher. I've got a cooking contest, um, this women's taking on gardening and greenhouses. The kids are <sighs> it's amazing to watch them because they thought, you know, my cooking group, they thought, I'm gonna walk in here, we're gonna go get some groceries and we're gonna cook. So day one, I'm like, uh, guys, what are you gonna cook? How much is it gonna cost? Who's going to teach you to cook it? What's, what's your grocery list? Where's your recipe? And as we started going through this, they started to realize, oh, that's why this is a project. <laughs> so we wanted to keep it student-centered. Um, we are using some of our wing times on Tuesdays and some Thursdays for these groups to meet. Um, 
This is the brainstorming, the first brainstorming session of the Gardening and Greenhouse campaign. This is uh, Mr. Straub's ideas for improving the cafeteria. And then I have the cooking contest group. One of the first things they decided is that they needed matching aprons. So that we made a phone call to some wonderful lady that I know that does a lot of sewing and she sent them aprons. So there's a lot going into this. They're meeting once, twice a week. And we're imagining it, this is gonna to go to the end of May. So these kids are really into it. Um, I think that we've given them a voice here I don't know if Angie agrees at all. Maybe her group's not as into it, I don't know. Maybe they're really into it. Um, but a lot of the kids really are buying it. So we're really excited to give them some voice here. So in conclusion, we realized at the end of this, as we're wrapping it up and thinking about what we wanted to say to you, everything we did for the past two months was about engagement. Everything we do is about how do we get kids into this building? How do we get them engaged? How do we keep them interested in our classrooms? The website increases in community engagement. The Wood Enrichment is keeping kids on task by giving them something outside the box. And then this project is working across content. And the other thing I wanted to say that I didn't put in here was the cross content piece. I'm so excited in this building to see more cross content work happen. Um, I got to go to sixth grade last week and teach sixth grade social studies about the Pythagorean theorem, right? I walked in there, I said, guys, I'm a high school math teacher, what am I doing here? And they were like, this is social studies class. I said, yeah. So we had a whole conversation about the history of the Pythagorean theorem. And then I taught them all about it and it was so much fun. And to have this building, you know, there's pros and cons in every school. But to have this building where as a high school teacher, I can walk down the hallway and meet those future students, it's just amazing. So, there you go. Any questions? That's great. Yes, uh, Just one technical question. This goes back to Sean, we talked about before. Mm -hmm. With these individual high school teacher pages getting up, are those going to get put into an iframe or something? They are their own websites and they are external, but I have a splash page now. So when you go to their pages, it alerts you that you're leaving the Ranger School page. Well, my only thought was you talked about with the iframe, you could show their whole website within it. It's just too. I don't, I don't think it's going to work the way that maybe we can talk after. Yeah, I can show you. Yeah. I just think I'm more, I think it's awesome. Our parents going to go to that. I'm just worried they're going to fall in the black hole. Right, and that's why well, my splash page tells them that they're leaving the site. So that was my yeah. intent there. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for being here. That was terrific. That was good. Kathy, that was great. you had a comment. I just want to say about parents. How do we, as a board, see this page? You go to the Ranger School website, and then you go under academics, and then yeah. Sean, you want to share real quick? Okay. Uh, so sure. going to show online how to get yeah, I oh, am actually going, going to share my screen too. So. Um, it's not so much a comment as a defense. I did not, <laughs> I did not have Sean Russell <laughs> helping me with my web page. No one knew. So <laughs> I've been waiting. That was my next question. <laughs> you killed me for five minutes. Question: yeah, Why yeah, did yeah. you not have me? Yeah, I didn't have Sean. <laughs> we could not have done it without Sean. I appreciate it. Hey, all that. of us need Sean. <laughs> Couldn't do it without you either. Absolutely. Um, so we'll connect on offline. Yeah, that. that would be great. Yeah. I think that's important. Um, do you want me to? Well, well and now uh, Molly's here to talk to us. We had a, this actually. This topic came up a number of months ago, and I think. At one point, we might have had Holly on the agenda, but she wasn't able to be with us. So she's with us this evening to talk very briefly about the bullying program in the building. This concern that they expressed about that. That's like all water got away last night, so I apologize. It wasn't mine. No, no problem. problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Like, luckily, we're all there. Um, yeah, I have my lovely assistant over there, Sean, who's going to help me out with this. I'm going to use this uh, opportunity to kind of highlight my web page too. Yep. But um, I'm under help, like, and I don't know if you want to go to it, like academics. Can show yeah, it. maybe I'll show you, Kathy, what I was going to talk about first, and then we can split over to social work if that's okay. So 
under academics, we have quite a few choices here, but one is the classroom pages and you can go under each of the schools. I guess in Rowena's case, it's high school. And um, all of these titles are hyperlinks to their websites and they'll give you a splash page telling you that you're leaving the Ranger School website when you go. Yeah, so they're all individual websites here. And then the same goes too for, um, like if you were to go to middle school, the same would be here. And then I also put um, by request different calendars for each of the uh, days given. Um, this year was a little scattered. <laughs> anyway, I'll go back to uh, so Alex Page. Yeah, um, and there's that little flash thing he was talking about. That's, um, first of all, I just, I've been working on my web page for a few years anyway. Um, I'm not real uh, great at it, so it doesn't look like splashy, but it's got a lot of information. You can see on the left side, this is the, the main page that you go to. Um, all kinds of different information. Uh, we're going to go down to my um, bullying prevention. But first of all, thank you for allowing me to present on this. It's a very uh, important responsibility that that we as educators um, hold, and especially as our admin and the staff that work on bullying reports and bullying prevention. Um, obviously, bullying prevention programs have been found to significantly reduce not only bullying behaviors, but also bullying victimization. So basically meaning not only do kids bully less when you educate them about it, but kids are also more able to prevent, or not prevent, but necessarily uh, Refuse the bullying and stop it from happening again. So, uh, we utilize the second step social emotional curriculum. Um, here it includes a separate four lesson bullying prevention unit for each of the grades K through five. We teach these at the beginning of the new school year every year. Um, and students, yeah, obviously during the school year when it comes up, whenever we can, we reinforce these the three R's basically of. of um, bullying prevention and it's first recognized is it bullying you know kids are being taught the difference between conflict and and bullying and i'll touch on that actually a little more than anything else because it's quite important um, but the second r is report how do they report to a caring adult what are the words that they can use and you know how to find that caring adult that will listen and then the third r is refuse they are taught words to say and how to respond when they see bullying happen, either if it's happening to themselves or their friends, and words they can say basically to refuse the bullying, ways to say no, stop it, that's bullying, that hurts my feelings, stop, things like that. Um, there's also a significant part of that for um, lesson program focuses on what to do as a bystander, because bystanders are very important for kids that aren't involved in the bullying, but they're seeing it happen, they need to know what to do, and a lot of that is in there. So. Uh, like I said, I'm using this basically uh, this great opportunity to also highlight my social work page. As you can still see there are lots of links down the side. And please, when you know anybody's looking for any help of any sort, you can send them to me or tell them to check out my page first. Um, and if somebody finds something that's not accurate or up to date, please let me know because I try to stay on top of it, but I'm not always great at that. Um, first, I'm <laughs> excuse me. Uh, already gone there sorry he's way ahead of me um i'm going to go through the links kind of on this page just kind of quickly uh but i'll answer questions at a later time if, if they come up the first link up there the second step curriculum the blue right there um will take you to what our second step curriculum is and it, it kind of has several videos about how it works and um and overall there's some a letter to the family anybody who's had kids here that have gone through while we've had the second step so when I'm talking about there's a place that you can go online and get resources that support um, the new second step program that's online for K to five is only like a, once every four or five weeks you get something sent home, whereas before it was weekly. Um, but at any point you can, you know, ask the, uh, either Mrs. Uh, Russell or myself where they're at. Um, the second. Well, down towards the bottom, I have the links to our bullying policy. I didn't print them all off for you guys to see. Oops, if you go back up for a second. Um, 
and then the procedures, those are the two policies um, show us what show what we do. Uh, I did want to um, just kind of go through how bullying reports are handled. So if you would click on the initial report form just down below where you are. This form can be found in our policy manual. It can be found on our um, web page. It can be found in the front office with Ms. Goldier. Um, we've actually given them to the staff at the Rangeley Health and Wellness Center because they had said that sometimes parents or students bring up concerns with bullying and we wanna make sure that everybody knows the first step to reporting um, bullying. If it's not something that an adult in this building sees or hears, and, and addresses it right away, it can be brought this way. It can also be a phone call. And then all of these reports, whether a parent, a student, um, or a school employee writes this out, if it's verbal, we will still always make sure we have this written down. And the, once, <coughs> once these forms uh, are filled out, they go right to the principal. So principal slash uh, superintendent, if it's K to five, and then obviously to the principal if it's six through 12. Um, the principal may decide to take actions immediately to ensure the safety if necessary of the student. Um, and obviously that depends on what the report is made and who's involved um, and what the situation is. If, for example, separating students, you know, seems to be the safest situation, that might be something they, they might do. Um, also, the uh, principal informs the parents of the alleged victim that a report has been made and why uh, and what the school is doing to protect the student from further bullying while an investigation is being done. Then the principal will utilize the resources, the education, training, and experience um, of our student services team to conduct a thorough interview. Um, if you go back, Sean, yep. and go to the <coughs> investigation form to the right of that. This is the form that we use to guide our investigation and, and you can scroll kind of down through. It gives you, and these are on, um, as you can see, they're here on my page, but these, this is also on the form section of our website. We want to make sure parents know um, what we are doing. It's not a simple one discussion with one student or two students. There is quite a bit of information that comes out of these. And sometimes they can take a couple, two or three days to get all the information that we need. Um, after interviews and the other information is collected, the team usually discusses and the principal will decide if the bullying is substantiated, basically doesn't fit the definition of bullying in our board policy. Whether it is determined to be bullying or conflict, um, the principal does recommend uh, disciplinary actions, support services, and if necessary, a report to law enforcement, which would be rare. I just want to make sure everybody knows. Um, parents of both the person reporting the bullying and the parents of the person bullying will be contacted separately to report the findings and any actions being taken to support or to discipline the students. A written notification will be made to a parent of the student if they've been found to engage in bullying, which also includes a process of appeal. So if a student doesn't I mean, if a parent or the parent and student don't agree with the outcome, they have an option to appeal it. Uh, one of the most frequent findings when investigating allegations of bullying is that while the behaviors may have been very inappropriate or very hurtful to another, it's often a result of conflict rather than bullying. Um, this is why I've added quite a few resources to my website to help explain the difference. I do have a short two minute video yeah, you want me to? Yeah, I do. I put it in a tab, but I believe the video. If you if you'd like to watch it at home, it's this video here. I have it right here. And this is from Pacer. They're a really good organization to support people with disabilities. Hey everyone, welcome back to Pacer Talks About Bullying. I'm Bailey. We're glad you're here. This week, we're excited to bring you another episode where we answer your most frequently asked questions in 60 seconds or less. Today's question is, what's the difference between bullying and conflict? Now that you know the question, let's get into the answer. Bullying is different than conflict. 
Let's start by looking at the definitions. Conflict is a disagreement or argument in which both sides express their views or opinions. Bullying is a negative behavior directed by someone exerting power or control over another person with the goal to hurt, harm, or humiliate. Now let's look at what makes bullying and conflict different, as there's two main differences. The first is that with bullying, there's an imbalance of power between those involved, meaning the person that's bullying has more power. This can be power in many ways. It can be physical power, social power, or power in numbers. Now, with conflict, on the other hand, there's equal power between those involved. The second difference is that with bullying, students will continue their behavior when they realize it's hurting another person. However, with conflict, students will generally stop and change their behavior when they realize it's hurting or harming another person. And that's a wrap on this week's episode of Pacer Talks About Bullying. Make sure to join us right back here next week as we have students answer the exact same question. So we'll see you this, then. And this is really important because we often have someone say something is bullying. And if we were to just listen to that one person without asking questions about what might have happened before, even not right before, but if there's been issues, like, you have to get a lot more information. Um, the one of the big things we teach the K to five, the definition really of bullying or the explanation is when somebody keeps being mean to somebody else, they can't make it stop. It's um, uh, it's one sided and unfair. So basically, when she talks about the power difference, that's usually quite key. Like if there's obviously an age difference or size difference. Uh, intellectual difference, like that could be a real important thing to look at. Um, but often when we're seeing things happen, it is usually a disagreement about something. For example, um, look, the younger kids, because this is harder for them to, to you know, understand, might run up and say, he just threw his arms at me like he was going to punch me. And I'll say, and they'll say, he's bullying me. And I'll say, well, tell me more. What happened right before? Well, I didn't think he was using the ball, so I took it, and then he got mad at me, and I wouldn't give it back to him. You know, at first glance, somebody, because they feel like they're being threatened, oh, this is obviously bullying. But then when you look at more information, usually there's something that sparked it. Now, is that bad behavior? Yes, and we're going to address it. But really keeping bullying, by definition, separate is important. We are by law um, responsible to report um, incidents of bullying to the state. And again, it, it usually rises to another level. Um, if you would scroll back to the first, oh, sorry, the other one, right there. This is another one that I help with kind of the middle age, middle school age kids, because again, it's not so clear for them, but this is on my web page, and, and this sometimes guides. Like if we talk to a kid and they say this is bullying, well, let's let's go through this, you know. And kids will often come to the agreement that yeah, you're right, it, it's probably conflict because I did this or said that. Really important um, because we don't want to be calling behaviors bullying when they're conflict. When behaviors are conflict versus bullying. We can use things like problem solving, conflict resolution, mediation. When it's bullying, it's handled in a different way. So the most important thing I want like the students, the parents, the, the board to know is that we do address allegations of bullying when they're brought to us, and we do take them very seriously. Um, I also want everyone to know that even if a situation doesn't fall into this bullying category, the principal, the student services team do put services in place to try and, you know, change the behavior to keep the conflict from happening again. And again, if it's bullying, we often not only support services for the student who's been bullied, but things perhaps like counseling, um, maybe meeting weekly with a certain number of our student services teams. We can do a lot of things. Uh, but we don't report back to the parents of the student who's been bullied. And I think that's one of the problems we see with parents want to know, 
what happened to this kid for what they did to my child? And I understand that I'm a parent too, but we have confidentiality laws that we need to follow. And you know, I wish we could be more open for that reason. But I just hope that you know, if anybody has questions or concerns about bullying, you know, come ask the questions to, to Mrs. Campbell, you know, Mr. Liberty, myself, any member of the student services team. Um, I did try to keep this uh, brief, so please, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. What is the process that the school uses when they receive a referral from the health services about students being bullied? We haven't ever actually received one, but it would be the same. Like if a if a student said to a doctor, and the doctor got permission from the student or the student's parents to fill out the form, we would still take the form. Um, the principal, whichever level it would be at, would work with the team and decide who and how it would be investigated. So it would be the same um, situation. Did that answer your question? I was under the impression that health services had made referrals. Not that I'm aware of. I haven't had other other comments or questions. Chris. Uh, to me, this is one of the biggest issues out there. My kids went through it. Both my kids were bullied. We worked through it with different, it's long before this administration, but we were aware of some of that way back. I, I like what you've done here for some stuff. Um, it's very frustrating from the parent side. And um, I would say outside the budget, it's the number one thing I get feedback on. And um, I'm just curious, a couple things. One is how many of these written reports have been done in the past year? Roughly, I'm not trying, I'm not, this is not a congressional hearing. I'm just asking I'm some questions. I'm pretty sure yes. we've had one in the last, since January. Okay. Um, I mean, we've received one report and we've done the full investigation on that one report. See, I wasn't familiar, and that's maybe my bad. I didn't go on your website and look at those things. So that's good to know. So if a parent comes to me and says, my kid's being bullied, then I'm going to recommend they go on the social worker site, they download the form, and they fill out the form. Or if they're more, if they're comfortable with it, they can go right to the front office and she doesn't put it off. Okay, yeah. and they can fill it up. And to me, they don't have, oh, sorry. It's also under parent form, so yeah, it's in, form. in in the policy annual. It's so the annual. other question I got, and this is the thing that drives me nuts, but I get it because my law background is that the whole confidentiality thing. Could we set up a form that like, if my kid was the bully and we issue, and the school issues a punishment for the bully, that I can sign a form that's a waiver that the kid that was getting bullies parents can know what happened because i think it would be i think it would be helpful and beneficial to understand mm -hmm. that there was consequence because lots of times in these scenarios it, it kind of goes into this, this confidentiality black hole and no one feels like there's been accountability and then there's feedback that comes back that's out there that people get upset and feel like well school isn't doing anything well I know the school's doing something, but you can't share what the school is doing. So to me, I would think as a team and check with the attorneys and see if there's a way to get that. Because I, as a parent, if my kid was bullying, I wouldn't have a problem signing a form that says, you can at least update and say, yeah, he got detention for that, or he got in-house suspension or something. So that that way it feels like this is justification. I'm worried if there's not a lot of reporting going on of this, is that in the old adage of, well, the kind of the flea circus thing, like, well, nothing's going to come of it. I'm never not going to know what's going to happen of it. And, and the last thing I want to see is without, it looks like there's a system here. And if the system isn't getting used, then it's getting resolved in other ways, and it might not be in good ways. And, and, that's, and that's my concern as a as a board member and a member of the public, because 
as far as I can remember back, my kids went through this whole school. There was always, every year, some of this bullying stuff. And I appreciate you taking the time to probably explain the conflict versus bullying part. But I've seen some pretty crafty bullies over the years where they can do like oh. stuff and then, well, that wasn't me. Trusty. You know, know it's, a, it's a classic, what I call narcissist behavior, where you, you poke, 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 and then you play the victim. And that's the type of behavior that I, I hope we can find a way to address and get on the other side. Because I've seen it just within my own children, how we can emotionally and physically make them physically sick about it and just break down and, and go from being a thriving academic student to just not wanting to participate. So for me, I appreciate that there's the tools there. I just really hope we can find a way to really get this to the next level because when I was here, I even called, I had the police chief come in for one of my meetings because I was like ready to file terrorism charges against one of the kids that was pulling my kid. And it's very important, I think, that the parents are actively involved in both the situations with my kids where there was things happening. I got in contact with the parent directly and that, and that helped to neutralize it as well. And I don't know how you, liability wise or what that does for the school, but I active parents and, and both kinds of parents on the other side were pretty good response with one parent more than others, but regardless, it moved things along. And I'm sorry I took up so much time with this, but this to me, outside of this to me is one of the more important things that I've seen cripple a child's academic experience in the school. And, and, and to me it's we really can check with with some of our about the legality of that, Chris, and, yeah. and we'll be more than happy to do that. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. I guess my question would be what constitutes filling out one of those forms, because I heard that she said only one has been filled out since January, and I personally know of several more parents than that that have addressed and expressed concern of bullying with specific peers. So I'm assuming a form hasn't been filled out for that. So I guess I want to know what the steps are to filling out one of those forms. And maybe it's that they're unaware that that form is available and that that's the first step in the process. So if you're in a position of being able to advise those folks, what you can say to them is go to Holly's website right there is, is a, a form that initiates a process. Well, personally, one of them was me. And oh, I didn't okay. get those steps to fill out the form. So I guess I guess. I don't know if I missed that step or if it's something I should have done and not to call myself out or my kid out or anyone out, but it was one of those people were me. So I guess I wasn't informed that I should have filled out one of those forms. So maybe other parents aren't being informed. It's very much so that's just a concern for me. Yeah. And so spread the word and Holly, do you have a response for that? I do. I want you to know that that was part of the one I'm talking about. It was added information. So we had already had information. And again, I can't share any more than that, but that information that came from you was included in that investigation. Okay. I guess that probably just would have been nice to know. Again, with the confidentiality thing, I'm sure, but as a parent expressing concern about bullying with my kid and other peers, it would have just been nice to be more informed of the process and such. So yeah. And again, I think I think Chris, if we could make that happen. You know, often kids will share that information. I'm quite surprised that when yeah. it doesn't get out, because they'll usually say, yep, I ended up in school for two days because that's, of that's definitely a legal, that's definitely a legal issue. And we would have to, we would have to have a little on growing on part of growing and listening to Joanne. So what communication is offered to the parent of the child who is determined to have been bullied. What do we tell that parent? Do we tell them that there's just been an investigation and forms have been filled out? Or are they actually let to know that in fact it was determined that their child was bullied and action was taken? What do we give that parent? I mean, you can't just say, oh, fill out the form and you know, we'll look into it. Because very often the drum and woodson answer doesn't work. I mean, you say, you know, there's an incident, a very apparent incident of bullying, and 
the answer they get is, well, your the legal counsel said not to say anything. That doesn't help the student and it doesn't help the parent because there's no acknowledgement of the act. So I'd like to know what do we do for that parent and child? The communication does not come from me, it comes from administration, usually the one that determines if yes, in fact. So once yes. the investigation has been completed, if it's deemed um, if it's deemed bullying, the parents of the child that was bullying is notified that this we did deem this as a bullying event. Mm -hmm. It will be reported as a bullying event, and we are taking steps to resolve the issue. Who's in on the investigation? Like who decides what is done? Who does all of that? Us to get together. And, but like, if you're a parent and you're like, oh, there's going to be an investigation, and I'm not saying I been one of them but being a parent so you want to know like who's investigating this what's <laughs> going on who's having a say and you know like this issue like jury try or fact yeah so like <laughs> you want to know if i get one and i don't know if i've had a high school level this last year we had one i use with student service so i get their form i look it over and some if it like obviously if it's something like this kid is in danger i would take steps to like maybe remove a kid from a class, like we would take steps immediately. Then Holly, I always work with Holly. She's excellent at the investigation. And then Heidi will help and they'll do the interviews. They'll interview several students. They'll talk to both parties. They take unbelievable notes. Um, and I review those and make a decision. And I will also, you know, if I'm stuck, I'll consult, be like, you know, we need more and we just do our best to. So it would be you, Holly, and then Georgia. Well, George, so if it's in high school, but George would just be the appeal. Okay. Like she would be the appeal. And um, just as a parent, like I always want to know yeah. what's involved in and it's thorough. every aspect. So just an example. So if we got one, the first thing we do is like say we talk to the person that the student filled out the report. Mm -hmm. We get a list of all the kids that may have been in the area, may have seen it, may also know what's going on. And every one of those gets talked to. And Holly is really good at not leading when she speaks to kids, like getting the truth what really happened and sometimes they match up boom and sometimes it's like they were in on different planets mm -hmm. and then we really have to dig and then we look at it and i looked at the conflict we have a flow chart with conflict and bullying and we make a decision based on that okay um, also if there is who fills out the form say if there's a complaint and the child comes to the parent is it the parent that fills out the form here or anybody yeah, or anybody if it's the child say they're elementary but they're not comfortable coming to the parent do they go to the principal and say this is happening and you fill out the form or do you contact or like does it change with middle school and high school like how does that process work can i can i speak you, to that because yeah, i'm pretty much at k to five i'm in all the time mm -hmm. they know i went into six through eight at the beginning of the school year reminded them if they would like to report bullying they could come to me i would help them we could write it down together they they could come to any trusted adult the adults in this building have been trained. If somebody says it's bullying, they know who to refer it to and where the forms are. Um, it can be if a parent calls and just says, look, this is what happened. My, my child is saying this. I write it down. It goes on a bullying report form, even if I'm the one making so it you, up. If a parent calls you and they have a complaint, I wouldn't have to physically come no. in to fill out the form. You would fill out the no. form, file the complaint. No. But if say my elementary school child had a complaint and it came to you, would I then get a call yes. saying there was Once the principal issue? gets it, you would be contacted. Okay. You would be told this report was, was made, this is what we're doing to investigate and we'll get back to you after the investigation is okay. completed. And I think there's a really good review of that process, both in the policy section, which Holly has posted on her website, as well as what's posted within the school policies under the drop down menu and also um, all the additional information that she has, Chris. Just a couple last questions. Sorry, I just feel this is a really important issue. It is very important. I'd rather take the time now. Um, if you fill out the report or another staff member does on behalf of the student, do you send a copy of said report to the parent so that they have a copy of it? Is that in our policy? Does that sound unreasonable? I would think it would make sense. I don't know what to, um, just so that they, they're they they're aware, because sometimes I know there's a, there's a trust thing, but I would want to get a copy of it if that happened. Yeah. You know, obviously ask the students, say, look, I really should send a copy of this to your mom and dad so you know what's going on. 
that's that's one question on that. And the second thing is, is I think follow up is probably crucial in this more than anything else. I mean, the incident reporting is important, but I think follow up is even more important. That it would be great, I think, that if after that's happened and maybe that's happening, say, look, we did the investigation, we determined it was bullying, we interviewed 17 witnesses, 16 staff members, four other admin, three admins were involved, we went through the process. I think if you took five minutes on the phone and kind of went through those key things and outlined it, and if there's some kind of a summary report to give well, to that the parents. What, isn't that what, what Georgia just said happens? <clears throat> if the incident goes to the point that it's determined to be bullying, then people mm -hmm. are contacted, that information is shared. But what I'm saying is, is that there's one way to share it. It could be like, well, it was determined bullying, but I'm just saying, I think it's important for them to understand the depth of the investigation and maybe you're doing that if you're saying yeah we interviewed 17 kids on this we determined the second <laughs> thing we've got that there i just think the more that we can kind of show the weight of the process and the, the amount of diligence and detail that you're doing then i think more people will embrace it and, and, and use it because it's just a perpetual problem that i don't think Ever going to go away? Yeah, bullying will never go away. Chris. Right. I agree. So what I'm exactly why I wanted to put that investigation form on the website so people can see that we're not just talking to one kid. Oh, okay, that sounds like bullying, or it doesn't. That's not what we do. I think you're right. I think that's important. And I'll just say conversations when you start saying something like that are well, which kids did you talk to? Did you? You right. know what I mean? So it gets very sticky. But I think that's something we could add in as a, you know, yes, we interviewed seven kids. Or we interviewed four teachers as well. We, you know, it happened in the gymnasium and we spoke to, I think that's important. You're right. I think it just helps both from the side when the parents not believing their kids bullying. And when the parent whose kids been bullied, they're both gonna feel better when you're able to say the, the breadth of the investigation. I'm not saying, say, and you can say up front, say, I'm not giving you names, I'm not giving you any of that because I can't, but this is the numbers by the numbers. And I think that gives in a little bit more legitimacy rather than oh we talked to a couple of people that that's all i'm saying so i'm just saying it's kind of sometimes how you spell it out versus there that i think will have a a bigger effect because to me i would rather you be flooded with these of there so that we can get this figured out and get it to the next level where it's like kids are actually going oh geez you know they actually stop for a second and say if i bully this kid there's going to be a whole process and stuff that could happen. And I go through that process because, with K-5. Because to me, I really believe that this year, these bullies are then the harassers and stuff that happen in the workplace and in other parts in life and get into other <laughs> professions. So this is our teachable moment to kind of fix things before they get out in the world. And I feel we have a fiduciary duty community to try to get a real good handle on this. I'm not saying we're not, I'm just saying no, I I'd really like to see it to the next level. This is the way we, we help change the course of further action. And I think there's a lot of teachable moments that are happening in the building and under your auspices. Um, Amber. Okay. Um, I first would like to say the forms are a great idea, and I think they've probably all been always been there, but I do have to say that. I have a lot of conversations with people who say, what form, how do I do it? And it has gotten better. Uh, being on the policy committee, I know we went through and you know this is a mandated policy that we have to have. Now, how we educate the community, I don't know because there's still people that don't know about the form. And I do think it's sort of a, I don't know, maybe it's an elephant to stick out there. Oh, and here's the form that we use if there's ever bullying, but parents do have to know. Um, being a teacher for as long as I ever have been, my superintendents always said one bullying case was one too many. So I always felt, oh my gosh, is that conflict? Is that bullying? So Holly, thank you for the programs that you've done because I think they've certainly helped. I mean, I know they've helped. Um, I also know that when I first came on the board, one of the first things I did was to check, there is a website with the state of Maine that tells how many school bullying, um, bullying episodes or whatever incidences have been reported. When I first came on, there were, there was one year, there were quite a few. We don't have a lot right now. 
compared to certainly the school that I left. So I'm hoping that through the education and the processes that that's why. But it's out there, folks. You can go right to it. You can see when it was reported, right. Um, right. the date, the year, and how many. I haven't gone for a couple of months. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is right now, but I know it is down from the first time I sat here as a board member. My first year here as an administrator, and all you can attest to this, I spent my first year in my office dealing Writing with up. bullying oh. the whole year. It was awful i think we probably had it was like 20 i don't know we had like six seven cases of bullying yeah there, there was one it year was, that it was like it was a lot. lot i mean i and then i will uh end my little perch by saying i agree with chris on the fact that parents of the bully and the bully and kid being bullied really if they work together it might work out my second oldest grandchild was bullied here. My son took her out of school. Nothing worked. Well, I'll tell you, he came in and the teacher said, and the administrator said, one's here, one's there. We've changed the seats. That's going to work. Come in and say it's working. It didn't work. So they all three have been homeschooled. What worked, though, eventually was that my son and the father of the bully came together, discussed it, and it ended. And I will go on to say that that young man today works in one of my establishments with my kids. And he has said to me, I was a turd once. And I said, well, I think you were more than that. And even the sister of the girl who was bullied said to me, is that the boy who bullied my sister? Because she worked with him, with him too. And I said, as a matter of fact, it is. And she said, it can't be, Mimi. Can't be, he's such a good boy. <laughs> so, um, and I had a couple of conversations with him, but I mean, I'm not saying that it always agree, it always would work, because I'm sure some parents don't think their kids do anything. But um, I do agree with Chris, it's a star. So if you know anybody that their kids say they're being bullied and the help isn't here and they filled out the form, whatever, maybe that's a suggestion, because I do know sometimes it's conflict and kids immediately think it's bullying. But, you know, clearly this is so, really a hot topic. And it it is a, a very, it is a very personal topic, and right. that's why, um, you know, as Georgia and I put these agendas together, we have these kinds of programs and presentations. So you have a window into what's happening in the school. You have a window into, and and as we discuss at our board meetings, adoption of policies, but also you, you become more informed about what people can do, what parents can do, and you're approached in the community. And so you become a liaison for the school to help parents understand that there is a process in place. There are forms available to them. They can call Holly, they can get help. And hopefully we can, we can get some resolution to some of these issues. So I, I that's to, very important. I wanted to just add, I'm, I try to be proactive. When I hear a parent has mentioned a possible bullying, like I've sent out an email and said, hey, I heard in this meeting you threw out there would you please, you know, consider putting it on a bullying report form? You know, I would like more information about it. And, and I know you follow through because we've talked. You know, when I've heard something I've, I've shared with you, and you followed through on that to see if it was a real issue. So I do know this is very important to you, Chris. And I, I think um, any any questions you have individually, obviously Georgia and Seth can also answer probably even better as far as policy. But I'm in that in there, and trust me, Chris, I know kids lie. I, I, I see it all the time, two kids in the same exact place that I am, and they both have different stories, and I just saw that they happened. So it, it, we do have to take those things into consideration. And oftentimes, you know, kids do have empathy, and I say, look, you're putting us in a really bad position. You're asking me, who cares about both of you, to decide who's being honest here, you know? And, and kids usually will fess up for the most part. If a kid doesn't, it usually indicates a more severe issue and that opens a door to getting services for better diagnosis and better um, services for those individual kids' concerns. And without saying too much, it's very helpful. Okay. Um, both those PDF forms are great that I saw them on there. I think if Sean worked his magic in about five minutes, he could use that Adobe thing and make them fillable so people can 
type in their information. It might make it easier for the person who has to read it, because God knows if I fill that out by hand, you would have trouble reading it. So, um, and if, if it's not something you guys can do, I have the software at work. Send me the option sure. download. Which we can, I think we can do it. But it would, I think that'll also get people to respond to it quicker if they could just type it in. Thank you, Holly. I'm going to bring, bring a, a close to this conversation now, unless somebody has something absolutely burning they need to say. Okay, we'll move on then. To, and thank you for all the presentations this evening. They were very informative, and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, I have a couple of things I need to share with you this, this evening uh, on my part for the uh, chair report. I just wanted to point out, speaking of what websites that Abby Thompson also has a website now for the library on on the, um, the school network and she has her newsletters featured there and it's an excellent site there are six please go in and take a look at them uh, Mr. don't miss Mr. Liberty's weekly video and I don't know how many of you are going in and watching them on a regular basis but they're uh delightful way of learning about what's happening in the building that particular week it features kids lots of great great shots of, of things that are going on in the building that are fun okay uh next big item i'm going to be passing out to you um the evaluation form for the superintendent uh jordan campbell and you'll notice that on this form you have a three-week window to fill it out. It's a paper and pencil. You can figure out how to type it first if you need to. Get somebody, get somebody to print it for you. Like I say, if you got three weeks, I might be able to you might be able to do it. Okay. And I will, but I also want to point out some other other uh, documents that are in your folder tonight. They're at the very end of your folder. And because the evaluation is going to ask you to um, speak specifically to George's job description. So you have a copy of her job description at the back of your handout. It's quite a lengthy, quite a lengthy piece of paper at the very end. And prior to that is our evaluation policy that we adopted back in 2019, which articulates the steps of the process for this evaluation. And that starts with a group of folks giving Georgia a confidential evaluation. And there are five subgroups within the building that will be receiving this evaluation. The board gets an opportunity to evaluate Georgia. The professional staff has an opportunity. The support staff has an opportunity, the central office, and also the administrative team. So those five groups will be receiving evaluation forms. The deadline is May the 2nd, which is three weeks out, a week after February vacation. So hopefully that's that's a reasonable window of time for you all. Um, we ask that you return them in this sealed envelope so that your confidentiality is assured. There will be a drop box in the central office where you can leave these forms uh, when you turn them in. And after that, um, I'm going to be requesting that any of you that are interested in serving on the evaluation committee to shoot me an email. I need two or three more folks to be involved in once the data is collated in, in looking at digesting, evaluating the data that we get back, and then writing a report for the board our intention is to have a written report for you to consider uh, at our June board meeting. We looked at trying to do it in May and realized that by the time we received the evaluation form back, it was only an eight day window before our May meeting. And that was just too quick a turnover to have a thoughtful process where a committee could look at the data, could write a report. Then we'll meet with Georgia in executive session in June at our meeting and we'll also provide an opportunity then for Georgia to also report out her contract requests that she has with us. So are there any questions about that? It's 
Uh, another announcement, we're not going to be hosting Zoom meetings anymore. Uh, we, in our policy, it states that there are extenuating circumstances that would allow us to have a board meeting on Zoom. And that is if someone has an illness, if they're traveling outside of the designated board area and they're not available, they can't be in town for the meeting or other extenuating circumstances. All you need to do is contact me and I'll give permission for your participation on Zoom. I'll notify Georgia and then uh, we'll have a window open for, for you to also participate by Zoom because with that policy, you now can make votes and they're, they're legally binding now as a board member if you're on Zoom. Uh, so the thing to note when you receive a copy of your board agenda for that month, if there's not a Zoom link at the top of the page, it means we're not having, no one has requested the need to have a Zoom meeting. Okay? So just kind of make note of that uh, when you when you uh, receive your agenda. Yeah, Julian. So will the public no longer be able to attend by Zoom? No, if we have a Zoom meeting, we have a Zoom meeting, then there is public comment on Zoom. The policy specifically specifies that. We'll so still if, live if stream we're on after. Zoom, there's public comment. If we're not on Zoom, they need to be here in person to participate. In the public How would they know that? How would the public be aware that I called in sick and during the Zoom? Because the Zoom will be on the agenda. So, and that's right. the only way they'd be able to but get the agenda sent out seven days ahead of time. Yeah. Excuse me? The, you send out the agenda seven days seven ahead of time. Days ahead. Joanne calls you Monday before the meeting and says I'm sick. Would, then we would send out notification to the community that, yeah. that it's that it's a Zoom option. Zoom and, and the board. Yeah. And the board. That's the best we can do. I don't. I don't know. See any other any other way to streamline that, Chris? I understand the agenda goes out seven days in advance. Well, why, why don't we just? I think there's an trying? easy way to do it. I would just keep the the Zoom link in place and say there will only be public comment by a Zoom if a board member is participating by Zoom, which only happens in extreme circumstances. Otherwise, the Zoom serves as a, as their live streaming, and it just don't allow public comment unless the board member is doing it that way and then that way you get the same link every time you don't have to worry about a procedural thing and it saves a lot of a lot of extra work i would think for you as the chair to make sure that oh geez joanne called me she can't come now we got to get the zoom john's got to make a link we've got to do all that stuff i'm just saying let's just put it there and just say only in the event that a board member participating in zoom will we accept public comment by zoom so if you really plan on coming want to speak Please come to the meeting, but it'll be live streamed. I, I, and again, Chris, I appreciate that, and I hear your concern. And what we're trying to do, given that we're now past the COVID scare, and we're now beyond really needing to use Zoom, we'd like to go back to a process by which we're meeting the public. We don't want to totally eliminate the possibility of a Zoom under extenuating circumstances because our policy does address that. But we've had absentees absenteeism at board meetings in the past for other reasons, Johanna. What was the policy pretty clearly? Uh, the policy we we adopted a policy about 12 months ago when we were really functioning a great, uh, almost completely on Zoom. Correct. We, what we was it prior we were, to that? We didn't have a policy because we were we never had Zoom so meetings. Joanne was sick. She would have said, she she just doesn't want to be there. there. She notifies me she's not going to be there. Not, yeah, but, not before the policy was in place. Just <clears throat> through, through COVID? Yes. COVID. Through COVID, that the state actually granted us a window of time when we, when boards could meet and zoom in together. But then, you know, that was rescinded. And so, so now they, but they have to, schools can adopt a policy to speak to that if a board member needs to be remote in. So would you rather have someone remote in or be absent? We, we encourage people to remote in, but but the policy states that it needs to be approved by the board chair. If a board member requests to remote in, 
that has to be approved by the board chair. In fact, we have an absentee policy that if you do not, if you're not attending a board meeting in person, you need to let me know or let the board chair know. And, and two and unexcused absences to, from the board is reason to dismiss a board member. Now, have we ever done that historically? No. Yes. Before your tenure. Okay, before my tenure, maybe people yes. were kicked off the board. Yes. I don't know. And we've had people who missed more than two board meetings and didn't let chairs know they weren't going to be at board meetings. But, Joanne. Did we see a benefit as a community to having the Zoom available? Yeah. I mean, yeah, didn't I mean, it provide an opportunity yeah. for yeah. more community yeah. interaction and um, more communication between the board and our community? I mean, I'm not quite sure I understand the downside of having the Zoom available for public comment on a regular basis. Okay. So I, I, let's, what is the downside of yours? Let's take it. Let's take that. Yes. I just was going to say, is there a reason? That we're not separating live stream versus Zoom. Because at live one time, not interactive. Yeah, well, right. right. At one time, we had talked about historically, I've done. We had talked about still live stream, but if you wanted to have a public comment, you came in person. That was one of the things that had been thrown around. Um, having I'm run the Zoom, it is. I'm not willing to leave the Zoom option on the table for everybody all the time. I just. I think that the notion was, and the thought came from the school, that we, we should go back to be being a board in person. And it, we didn't want to totally eliminate that option. I think, yes. I just think for not so much the board, as a board, okay, maybe we are required to be here in person. I kind of understand that. But coming from a community member and being friends with a lot of parents, Child care is a hard thing, and I know people say you can bring your kids here, but nobody wants a four year old running around. Like, oh, you know, I got a four year old, nobody wants that. You know, it's distracting. So, I have spoken to a lot of parents who said that they attended more when there was a Zoom option because they can set their kid down with a movie, put them down with a snack, and participate in the board meetings. So, I think that's a very crucial thing to parents. I think they want to participate, but not all of them have the option to be here in person. And I appreciate that, Kayla. And we live stream our meetings. So the only the, the additional advantage that a Zoom right. option provides is that is that if we're on Zoom, they could they could participate. Karen, you want to no, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, you know, we are a tourist town. We have parents that may work opposite shifts, some work nights, some work days. If they can't be here, live streaming is okay, but if you don't hear a portion of that. Um, speech or presentation, you don't have the option to answer a question, and then you rely on other people to give you information which may or may not be true. Right. So I would say let's be open to the community and keep our Zoom link to every single meeting. Okay. I just think it's it's a, it's just a, a benefit to the community as a whole. I hear. Okay. In as much as communication is out is the goal one of this board, I would suggest that the Zoom continue and public comment by a Zoom being an, op be an option for every member of the community. I'm not sure that it can be due to the policy. The policy says that if if a board member has to remote in and there's a Zoom option available, then public comment has to be um, offered. So I would just need to check. We would just want to double check that. We want to make sure we're following the policy. That's all. Well, don't we make the policy? Yeah, yeah we just adopted a policy about 12 months ago when it was very clear that Zooming was going to become part of the behavior of the board for an indefinite period of time. And in that policy, it states that if we are on Zoom, public we must offer public comment on Zoom. That's a legality. And and well, we adopted the policy. Well, I'm suggesting that as part of our goal one communication, right? Perhaps we should relook at the policy okay. and determine that Zoom with a public um, speaking option within that Zoom. Be available to our community to make our board very accessible to everyone. So, yeah, I was just going to say pretty much the same thing. I will, 
I'll, I'll, I'll put it down. I'll bring it up at our next house. Okay. And we'll go over it a little bit next. Okay. Thank you. So, and at this point, I'm hearing consent agenda items. Yes. That we're going to leave the Zoom link on the top of our agenda. We're not going to tamper with that at this point in time. And by and by virtue of our policy, and we'll review that. Just, you know, public participation is part of that. We are obligated to provide that. Great. Okay. I think it's an excellent. Thing. I totally agree with what everyone had said. I think um, it might be important to note too that we potentially will be moving to Google Meet, not Zoom. So we might want to just put web conferencing and not be kitty cornered into a specific Can platform. You speak up a little bit, Sean. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. There is an answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <laughs> the, after June, there is good potential. We will be moving to Google Meet instead of Zoom due to licensing requirements. Oh, okay. We have a, um, we were given a, provided a grant with Google to um, use their services at a higher rate than Zoom. So um, the Zoom licensing is extremely expensive. So we potentially will be moving to Google Meet to host these longer meetings, have the ability to host more people. It basically functions the same way, but I just don't want there to be a policy that specifically says Zoom because we might be moving to Google Meet. So we'll, go, we'll double check that at the policy meeting. And it basically Maybe works the same way you put the link. with an update on Google Meets right. then at our main meeting. Yeah, and it, that, that sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. That's all I have to update you on now. I'll turn it over to Georgia. Okay, thank you. Um, to start, last Thursday, we uh, had our first uh, school wide assembly, first time since, wow, I don't know. It was a, it's been a long time. It was a lot of fun. We had um, student council actually. Uh, facilitated it it was well done um, we it, 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 it was just wonderful it was so great to see the bleachers filled back up again and we were able to give out um, some uh, most improved student awards so those students will be going to the sea dogs um, there were was teacher karaoke there was just so many great things that happened we laughed it was it was really we, we joked it was a lot of fun on Friday of last week, the RFA hosted a presentation of the Scholastic Awards. Sonia Johnson presented the awards along with some help from um, Chris Farmer, Kayla Alexander, and Karen Seaman. Thank you uh, to all for making this the most memorable evening, and congratulations to all of those that were awarded. Uh, Angelica Woodward, who is going to be our student rep um, next year, who's filling in tonight for Maya Liberty is going to speak a little bit more to this um, in her student report out. Let's see. And the last thing that I'd like to share is, uh, I think at the last board meeting, I mentioned that we had applied for a Title I summer allocation grant for summer programming. Um, we were awarded the full amount at $11,500. So, um, very excited about that. It kind of offsets our SO3 um, money. So we have a little bit more in there to, to spend because of it. And so um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Seth. I'm going to let Aunt Helica go first so I don't steal any of her <laughs> really to meet about some of the shared plot that we have overlap. So I'm going to let her go first. She's here to share what she needs to um, high school singers Salila Valley and Daxton Williams went to Connecticut for a musical performance. Miss Smith has videos if anybody wants to see them, they can talk to her. Um, softball, uh, varsity softball started. And the first game is going to be April 26th against Temple at Colby College. AP Art and Spanish 3 4 students traveled to Boston this past weekend to visit a Frida Kahlo ex exhibit the New England Aquarium and the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And um, as Ms. Keppel was saying earlier, the Scholastic Arts Awards were this past Friday and I received an honorable mention. Emily Eastlack received an honorable mention in a silver key. Gracie Feeney received an honorable mention. Avery Flowing received an honorable mention. Addie Hemingway received a silver key. Winnie Laura received an honorable mention and a silver portfolio key. 
the Lila Valley received an honorable mention, a silver key, and an honorable mention portfolio. Bristol Quimby received an honorable mention and a silver key. Alice Schaefer received a, three silver keys and an honorable mention portfolio. Lily Schaefer received two honorable mentions. Amelia Stokes received two silver keys. Shirley Truren, Truland received a, a silver key. Eric White received an honorable mention and Ollie Scherer received two gold keys. Ollie's work will advance to national level in New York City where it will be jury for national recognition. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you for subbing tonight and for accepting the role of the That's terrific. Um, so see, took some stuff off my list. Um, <laughs> Angelica actually came up today. We met with Laura Hoft. She's a Franklin County School garden coach. And um, Angelica approached me as part of the project um, earlier this late winter, early spring, and um, wanted to start a gardening club. So Angelica is starting a gardening club, working with Ms. Christensen. And we talked to Laura Hoff today. She's going to come to our school to help us not only with the club, and they provide services like they'll come and help us with education. Today she dropped off maybe 10 bags of potting soil, help us find grants. Um, we had a question about chickens on campus. She's gonna find us a bunch of resources from schools that do that. Um, so that's pretty exciting. It ties directly into the project. Um, other schools in Franklin County are, you know, supplementing, they have a, they'll have a farm stand on campus. They're having a salad bar in the cafeteria with school grown produce. Um, so we're really excited to work with her and, and Helica is starting a club to help with that. So nice work. Um, Middle school science has been quite exciting. Um, last week was starfish. I missed that. Um, I had to be out for a day, but today we did. They did frogs, and I get. I was like, I just like this is what I'm doing today. So I helped. I kind of wanted to get in and watch her a little bit, but I ended up just like helping. It was so much fun. Six, seven, eight, all dissected frogs. Um, it was really cool. And I think out of all of it, I'm guessing maybe like 90% participated. Some kids are just like, I can't do it. And for all those of us who remember doing it, it doesn't smell as bad anymore. <laughs> it's not formaldehyde, I don't it's think. It's kind of funky, but it's, it's not funky, bad. It's funky, but it's not as bad. Because walking past there, I was like, what is and that? So, and we successfully got the brain out of one frog, and it's really small. So <laughs> one track line there. Um, so that was really cool, and she's doing an amazing job. We have assessments coming up. Um, starting in May, the main state assessments will start. We're using an OEA once again. We'll do all three math, reading, and language, and then the science assessments the same. I'm a little, I'm wondering how long it'll take because last year it was the pilot year, and like at the fifth grade level we started it, it was like 15 questions. The kids are done in 15 minutes, we're, so we're, we're still we're scheduling. We don't know what it's going to be, and we didn't get a lot of data from that. We got some numbers, but there was no comparative data, nothing. I mean, really nothing. So hopefully next year we'll have more info from that. And if Sean, if yeah, you want to show the website. Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So I worked with Sean a little bit. We added some assessment information um, on the website and some curriculum stuff that I want to share. Yeah. So in terms of this new media day, yeah. when do you think you're going to come to the board with some kind of comparison? So I think I'm, last year I waited because I didn't want to present something different than the state data because you know, we do NUIA in-house, we have our data we use, and then I knew in the fall the state was going to take it and then do the comparison data. And they pretty much use exactly what we use as far as like low average average. So it'd probably be if we do it in May, June, July, probably more realistically July. Because it when yeah, in August or yeah, absolutely. And probably before yeah, and I'll have something in July, the, the testing window. Yeah, the testing window spans the, the June board meeting. They they extended it um, a little bit. But yeah, and I'll feel more comfortable. I didn't want to like present something that didn't match no, what the state was going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping the science data will be more usable. So just this kind of ties into the assessment piece. So with working with the curriculum committee, um, we didn't have a lot on our web page. So this week, Sean and I got to start on this. So under academics, you'll see the curriculum and assessment. You go to assessment, Sean. Sure. So if you come here, this is just, it's just a rough, we just got this on, some good um, information. The introduction to NUIA, it's just a good information page for parents. They can go get to read about NUIA. The main science assessment is the information. Oh, my eyes are going, Sean. Main science information. Um, this is another thing I'm realizing in my life right now is I 
<laughs> need binoculars. Why assessment? Um, main science information. That will tell you about the main science assessment we're using now that we piloted last year. Um, why it's important, why participation matters. There's a lot of information there because you know parents can opt out, but this is why, you know, how we use the data, why it's important, not only for the data to drive improvement and in instruction, but funding um, from the federal and the state level. The 21-22 parent letter, I will be mailing that out um, maybe next week. I was, I'm deciding I might wait till right when we get back from break so it's fresher when you get it about um, what's going to happen and maybe I'll have grade level schedules done by then. And then the 21-22 assessment calendar um, okay. for our district. So that's the start in our assessment page. Those are all hyperlinks too. Yeah, they're all hyperlinked. Um, and then the curriculum. Yeah, and then we got to start in our curriculum page and where we are right now just i have our some stuff from our vision and mission about curriculum what we expect just that little note due to like the last couple of years we've had significant disruptions we're doing a lot of work like what doris presented what shelly's going to present about looking at curriculum and what i have for links right now those links all of our stuff is aligned to main learning results those links take you to the main page um not entirely parent user friendly <laughs> I think it is intended to be that way, but over time, we'll have more of our own information on here that will be much more parent friendly. You know, you go to the state web page, it's a little overwhelming, a lot of teacher talk um, and stuff, but that's a start. We did that this week. And, yeah. uh, and that's in response to the goal to uh, yeah. curriculum. Yeah. Work, so, so we checked a couple right. boxes this week on yeah, that. So I guess. Um, I feel like I have to go to the website almost every day because mm -hmm. there's something new on it. There's something new on yeah. it every I day. I did. Um, Oh, sorry. And I'm, I'm a little, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So we're going to, it says curriculum assessment. I think we're done. We'll say curriculum assessment instruction. Yes. Right. And, you know, that's where the program studies will lie. And we want that link to teacher pages. Um, and just maybe some other resources, like as far as like how to support your kids. But then Sean is like, I should do a blog. Yeah. Every week. Let's keep it with going. Those supports. Yeah. But I want to have like a nice instruction page too, where if parents have questions, they can go and be like, oh, Homework help guide, how to work with your kid on a project, how to start having some resources there. So yeah, it's a start. That's what I have. I will say yeah. too, just to talk about what Seth talked about today about the um, science dissecting. There was a post on Facebook and there is a post here in the um, uh, news and announcements about the uh, dissecting and some photos of mm -hmm. some dissecting frogs. So. Yeah, in my video this week, we'll have like a flash before be like, View discretion advised because um, <laughs> I got a little, I got some photos. Yeah, and no, it's cool, kids, to, cool to see. View discretion advised. The kids, some kids, one child like took this frog apart and it was like art. I mean, you looked at that thing, it's like, what do you want to do? It's like, I want to drive race cars. <laughs> Surgery? <laughs> like, medical profession? No, but like, so he's like, it was really cool. Yeah. And some of the people you'd be like, oh, they're going to get that frog. They were far away. They're yeah. Like, yeah, I just watch. Yeah, so that's good. Thank you so much, Seth. I oh. Finance, uh, we did not meet this week. Um, we've been doing, however, uh, via DocuSign, which we had to do an extra one because I signed in the Georgia spot. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. It was a technicality. The way you were putting the system. Because so uh, I was like, oh, I just signed this. And I said, wait a second. I think I signed it. I heard about that. And I was like, anyways. 
So we review, um, just so the public knows, we review every thing that goes out before it goes out, uh, payable list, all of that, and uh, are open to be able to ask questions. And uh, Jeff chuckles about it because he always is like, he tries to guess which ones I'm going to ask questions about. But uh, it's it's a good way. And then we review pretty much every check that goes out that way for the payables and then for the payroll. And we do that. We get those through a uh, uh, secure link for DocuSign. And we can go down through. And they, Roxanne and the team, they do a great job. And we can see everything. And there's a receipt. And, I've never once called and said, well, what about this? Before they could say, yep, we got this information and this is why. So I think everyone's been very prepared on the other side of that admin and finance. And uh, it's gone well. And tonight we're going to be signing the warrant for the budget and, uh, of the off and on 15 years I've been involved with the school board. I think this was the easiest budget season we went through. Uh, I don't think anybody tried once. <laughs> it was, you had, it's tough. It's tough going through this tough decisions to make. And uh, I think everybody as a team worked well and, and got through it. And I hope we gave a nice uh, encouragement for the municipality to deliver a similar efficient clean budget, hopefully not a big increase as well. So well, the board, board has to say. Uh, me personally, that's thanks in large measure to your leadership, Chris. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. You bring a lot of expertise to that process, and we're able to keep the percentage increase down to a, a, a level that I think surprise, surprises most everybody. I haven't heard anyone complain about a 1.39% yeah. increase so uh, compared to last year. So, um, two things I did want to mention those. Board members and public who have not didn't have a chance to be there on Friday and see the art display. It is at the art uh, and there's hours of it's open. And I encourage you to go look. I mean, there's this stuff you're gonna want to buy for your house. This is some pretty cool stuff. A lot of different mediums were used, stained glass, acrylic, everything. It's unbelievable. Um, the, the students are incredibly talented, but I also have to say, you know, what Louie and especially Sonia does with the high school level is unbelievable. If you went back through and, and did a little search and see how many students have qualified for keys and qualified to go to art school. I mean, my daughter's going to one of the top art schools in the country and I contribute that a lot to Sonia putting in the time with her on that. And we've had several students that have been in, one in the congressional and been uh, their their artwork shown down at the uh, uh, down in Congress. So I mean, it's a big deal, and there's some really good stuff there. And take five or ten minutes when you're in town there, and you know maybe when the frosty's open, you'll get a chance to go over there. And, and go. So and Seth, your videos are great. I did want to mention I would prefer for the ADD ADHD type of people like me. It should be a TikTok version. <laughs> <laughs> One minute, yeah. I can watch it. I get, I get the highlights. It's so hard. I get so many things from people. Oh, that's oh, yeah. so long. It's like, you do a good job. yeah. No, I've been told I need TikTok though. You do need TikTok. <laughs> well, I'm manage, Chris. I need a social media. The kids would probably watch it too. Yeah. The kids would watch it. I mean, I'm gonna say it. One minute TikTok. Probably help you. Yeah, that's right. Not a bad idea. Oh, okay, guys. Moving on. Just get late. The finance or the facilities, yeah. Well, we did not meet because we had only meet this coming Thursday, so we will not be here in April. Um, the only question I have, for, just a quick one for Jeff, and I don't want to throw you under the bus. Just wondering if there's any update about the floor surface replacement did, portal. I did get one this morning, but I did not, I did not open it up. Okay. Email. Yeah, got a price on a couple, doing a couple different ways. But so we're still working on that. Yeah, so a work in progress. We can we can report out next time. Okay. Great, thank you. Great. All right. Do you have anything uh, additional to say about goal one, Chris or Joanne? Communications. No, I think we we had our last meeting on that, which was what date was that? That was uh, about three and a half, three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. I don't have the date off the top of my head. But okay. We walked out of there, concluded that we completed. Yes. Everything that was required by the state, that goal was complete, and we could put it in the books and recommend to you that we were ready to dismember the, uh, the committee. 
And in, in addition, to, and in addition to that, dismember. just that you wouldn't dismemberment aside. In, a, in addition to that, we also reviewed and brought forward to the policy committee two different policies that in total address all of the needs of uh, communication in the district that definitely satisfy the law that was enacted on the 18th of October. The legislatures and the lawyers will be happy. They will be happy, absolutely. So how about Kathy and the curriculum committee? Um, well, we met um, 21st of April of, of March, rather, as well, um, and discussed the goals that we had formed in February. Um, number one goal set, and Sean had already started working on it, and that is um, to make available on the website that uh, benchmarks and content area and all that stuff. And they started. They yeah. started, yes. And yeah. It's really great. So uh, that was our one thing that we had wanted to do action on. The other was um, making reading lists available uh, to the to parents and the public, and they're hoping that that will be accomplished by the fall of 2022. Most of this is for high school and middle school. Um, also bringing courses of study to the board and um, putting the yearly course of study on the website, which would be part of that first thing that we just did, right? Yeah, that the first study should come now. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that goes, we're thinking fall of 20. Uh, new programs would come to the board with presentations from teachers or whoever, and um, that would, of course, be as, as it occurs. And the same with uh, curriculum changes. Any curriculum changes would come to the board as they occur. Um, Sean will give us the ability, you know this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sean will give the board the ability to check um, syllabi online. Sure. And that. Um, still has to be set up and, but that's that's in the works anyway so we want to encourage teachers to communicate with parents which already is done encourage parents to give questions and or misunderstanding to teachers first and but we put that in the newsletter and also using assess uh, weekly video to help achieve some of these goals and that would be as needed um we plan to meet again June 6th, the same day as the policy, because we have this meeting right before policy. Um, and um, we will look at all these things again, what we've accomplished, what we did, what we have to tweak, or whatever it is. And then we won't meet again until the fall and uh, see what, how, and what we've accomplished for meetings. So, and Kayla, you're welcome to either of this too. No, it's just so early in the day for me, just with work and everything. It's hard for me to, uh, to get there with the kiddos and the homeschooling one of my children, and at two o'clock, this is not feasible for me. So we can maybe talk about that and see whether or not we could bump it up to after a policy meeting, which would make it later in the day yeah. so that Kayla could participate. Yeah. Um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that we'll talk about because there's so many people to yeah. kind of make. I, I'm free anytime. Yeah. I don't know either way, but if it were later, I would probably be more happy to be able to say. And, and just a real quick aside along the issue of reading lists for parents. Uh, Abby Thompson does a beautiful job in her newsletter that's featured now on the website, yeah. making making tons of recommendations about books, books and great appropriate books for kids. And so that's another terrific resource that people parents can go to. In order to find those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Here is on the board. Yeah. Here is on the board. Yes, absolutely. We're readers too. Okay, Georgia, are there any appointments, resignations, nominations, or transfers? Yes, I am um, going to recommend our spring coaches for middle school baseball, uh, Chad Nickerson, for middle school softball, Brittany Russell, and for varsity softball, Kate Cook. Any comments or questions about coaches? Okay. They're already coaching, aren't they? Yeah, yeah they're coaching. Moving on to action items then. First is a consideration to approve the 22-23 school year calendar. This was a 
topic with quite a bit of discussion at our last board meeting. And subsequent to that, uh, Georgia has two additional drafts of a schedule for us to consider. And I'll turn it back over to Georgia. So, um, based on our conversation at the last board meeting, I um, told the parents about starting before or after um, Labor Day of the parents, of the percentage of the parents that responded, 81% of the parents said they wanted to start after Labor Day. So draft two is, draft two is um, the calendar which um, reflects that to start after Labor Day. I took this calendar to our Rangeley Teachers Association. Um, we um, are supposed to meet and discuss with the Rangeley Teachers Association the calendar and bring back any recommendations um, they may have. They actually um, did not, were not in support of this calendar. Um, and so what they are in support of is the draft three calendar. Um, and there are some reasons, um, and um, Brittany uh, Russell is here and Rowena is here as well, and they will also chime in. I will give you permission to chime in if you'd like um, from a teacher standpoint. Um, I, some of the conversation, and I'm just going to lay out the facts. I, it's ultimately tonight, this is going to be your decision to make. But I just kind of want to lay out some of the stuff that came up at the last meeting. One of the things that came up, or at least one of the things that I think I heard, was that Labor Day weekend, we have a lot of high school students um, that are working that weekend or very, very busy. And we looked at our absentee, um, you know, absenteeism that day or those days starting school last year. We had maybe two or three high school kids absent. So it wasn't reflective of that. Another thing that I think that I'd like to mention. Wait, what, I'm sorry, I, missed that. I was trying to figure out the difference between the Southern and the So we only had, a, we, one of the things that came up was the concern around the businesses and our high school students working in those businesses. If the, our attendance, we looked at our attendance for, um, the beginning of the school year and our attendance at the high school level is not reflective of that being an issue. Um, and another thing that another point that I'd just like to make, um, our foster tech students, and we have a great, we have a large percentage of juniors and seniors that go to foster tech. Um, regardless of whatever calendar is being uh, is being approved here, our foster tech students will start the 31st. That's when foster tech starts. August. Yeah. Can you just highlight some of the behavior differences here as it's showing up? So, so, so draft two is just if the, that calendar is reflective of an after Labor Day start. So the first day, yep. So the first student day would be September sixth. There's not a lot of change. There's nothing else. Oh, there, there is another change that I did make to this. We discussed Christmas break. So um, in our in draft one, we had the 21st as the early release day. I took the 21st, we took the 21st away and made the 22nd the early release day. So we did gain a day back there. Um, we did, and, and another topic of discussion that came up was the April 14th day. So we went back and looked at um, the number of students Sort of gathered some data around the number of students that are absent um, that were absent that Wednesday. We had about 35 students absent last year on that Wednesday, and on that Thursday we had 48 students absent. Currently, um, this currently next week, next week we have I, we have signed pre-approved absence forms for 26 students. So we have students out next week, all of next week. So yeah. Can I just chime in on thought on that? Yeah. Perhaps the reason why you have so many students absent the week before is the cost of the tickets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Definitely. We, we understand that. Right. Yeah. We and I think that. totally. Initially, that's it happened when I was not here. I think that's why they added that Friday before break is to like at least on one end of vacation. 
to give people that travel day that was not within the school week. I, I think cheaper. that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I'm looking at these two, and I don't see many differences other than the two days longer before graduation. So if we did start after Labor Day, what are the major differences in these two calendars that the that the board, the the committee that you said you met with, didn't agree with? Drop out three, you're starting before Labor Day. Right. No, right, but there's only two days difference between draft two and draft three. Graduation is only pushed two days further. So what are the two, what are the big differences that that committee that we met with argued? That's, so that's, a, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked that, because there are some, some real, I think that academically, it's, so teachers are looking at this from an academic standpoint and a seat time standpoint, so I'll let them speak to this. And that committee, by the way, Kayla is the range of the teacher associates. Okay, thank you. No, that's just what I want to say first. So the committee was else. So Britt and I are both on the RTA. Um, so we were both at the meeting where we did not um, accept draft two, which at the end of the day, you guys, it's it's not, we have nothing binding. It's you guys are going to make your decision. Um, we unanimously felt that students are more productive at the beginning of the school year. By the time we get to June 13th, 14th, 15th, the kids are out. If we had enough snow days to push us past that Juneteenth holiday, kids aren't going to cut back. So we lose those two days if we don't put them at the beginning of the school year. If we have more than, I think it was, there was only one snow day, I think, in that original calendar. We were willing to kind of come back with a compromise. Originally, the calendar had four student days before Labor Day. And then the workshop days the week before that, we counter proposed two student days and the reason we did that was for several reasons. One is that it does then align us with the same start date as foster tech, which obviously we don't want to run the whole K through 12 around foster tech and we get that, but it does give us alignment. The other reason is it gives the teachers two days with their kids for not simple. If the high school level, we have an every other day schedule, it gives us one day with each of our sets of classes to do syllabus, classroom rules, reintegration, supplies, what do I need? And then they go home over that Labor Day weekend. When they come back Tuesday morning, we're ready to dive in. Um, it also gives the kids kind of a graduated re-entry to school. You know, the two-day week, four-day week, five-day week. Um, the high school kids that did need to work, we've always said they could still have excused absences. I think that's just it for us. It's just we strongly feel the kids are more productive and we get way more done on those two days before Labor Day than we will ever get done on two days in June. Well, and then Kayla. I appreciate the input. Thank you for clarifying your, your pieces on that. Um, <clears throat> Georgia, your comment about, well, you know, we didn't have any students that did that. I don't know a business owner in Rangeley that would say that any of their student kids don't go to don't go to school and work for me. You know, if school start, go to school, we'll figure it out. So I'm I would expect it would be zero or not or maybe one or two that would do that. So that to me, but well, I understand where you're coming from. I just don't think there will ever be data for that because I can't imagine any business owner saying, miss the day first day of school to work for me. It's just not going to happen. Um, we are a tourist town. I always feel like none of the kids, our, our kids with a labor shortage right now, every high school kid that has any eagerness in their life from age 14 on will be able to be fully employed the entire summer. And the breath of air really doesn't come until that last week. And all of a sudden, parents realize that they've been working their tails off too for the tourism. Oh my goodness, summer's over. We should try to do something. Labor Day weekend is always a beautiful weekend. Dale and I were talking about that. It's like the weather is always, it plays out. September is the best month of March. And I feel that it would be, it outweighs the two day piece to do that. I think 100%, I get the whole get with the middle school and the high school kids, their syllabus and the rules and all of that. 
we just earlier had an excellent presentation about all the teachers having their own web pages. You know, when I was in college and all that there, I always blew off the first day of classes at college because all they did was pass out the syllabus in there. There wasn't any action. I'd go to the teachers and get the teacher's information and go. So I think we can solve that particular part and, and, and we get the word out and we set the stage before the kids finish the end of the year and say, hey guys, you're gonna be able to find middle of August or the or the first week, that last week in August, you're gonna find the syllabus, the rules, all that. We're starting that Tuesday, full board. Be ready. Yes. And I know that there'll be kids that will show up unprepared and do all that. That's just the way it is. I just want to reiterate my point, though, Chris, that that foster tech kids will be starting before Labor Day. That's the, the first day for foster tech is the thirty first. Yep. So foster tech students are impacted. What percentage of our high school students go to foster tech? About a third. What? I'd say this year it's close to a third. High school. So does that mean those kids want a couple kids, extra days? Maybe that so might be mistaken. I'll put it like it was initially. It was initially almost a third. It's probably so getting they can, they can go. I, I, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, I don't have the exact initially. Just a ballpark. Yep. Fifteen. Fifty percent of the kids. Fifteen kids. Fifteen. One five. One five. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. When I said thirty percent initially, it was like we had like twenty kids call, so it's kind of like fifty. Yeah. And they're juniors and seniors. I just want to make sure I'm reading this calendar right next to you. This is a dumb question. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm hey, the only no one questions. asking. Hey, no no questions. Questions. But I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. So this top draft here is to start on the 31st and the 1st and then have a vacation on the 2nd, correct? Yes. Okay. And then the second one is to start. No, actually, sorry. Oh, okay. Draft two, the first date on draft two, the first date. Student date is September 6th. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Two workshops in the yeah, staff. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. And then on draft three, the first student day would be the 31st. Okay. So the big difference okay, thank is you. Before, Sorry. before or after Labor Day. Yes. Karen and then Joanne. Joanne. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Karen. Um, I've worked in the service industry my entire life in this town. I don't understand. <laughs> there are not that many kids that work in the service industry. So I don't feel that starting before Labor Day impacts that many businesses. They still have the opportunity to work that weekend. And frankly, Monday, late Labor Day, the actual holiday, is very quiet in this town. And I do feel that having the kids stay longer in June they have checked out. I've seen it. <laughs> I was one of those kids. I've had those kids. So if people, the whole Labor Day weekend is basically families in town, they're not going on vacation Labor Day weekend. They're here. They're enjoying that beautiful weather. So I just, I just think my vote will be to go before Labor Day. Thank you. I had a question about the teacher workshop days. Are the number of teacher workshop days prescribed by a contract or teachers have to do 182? So are they filler to achieve 182? They have to do 182. And are they mandatory attendance and full day events? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think they're they well designed, Joanne. They're not filler. They're, they're really no, no, I, I'm just because they yeah, all yeah. seem to be with the holiday. Okay, I just wondered how that works. Any more questions or comments before somebody makes a motion for one calendar or the other? Okay, can I have a motion then to adopt draft, draft two, which is starting after play Chris, can I have a second? Okay. Uh, any discussion before we vote? We pretty much have. All those in favor of draft two? Got that? Do you have that? Really? One sec. Hold your hands up. Hold your hands up. Sorry, I'm not as good as Abby. 
because this is also weighted voting. So right, I just want to make sure. Um, okay. I think you're. I think it passes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all those opposed to adopting calendar two. Is it passed by quorum? Give me one second. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I I understand you have to calculate it. Absolutely. I mean, I just have the numbers. I don't know. I'm like Abby does. Um, does that have to be 500 to pass? No, 500 to pass. What's the it's 500 to pass? Yeah, so what does it pass? Right there, this is the form. Oh, it's form is 1003. No, it's 997 now. So we weigh each individual. So we weigh each individual. Yes. Whoever votes three votes, I think it has to be. And you got one Dallas, one Houston, 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 it's a reasonable amount. I don't know. It's just we we count a little less sometimes. We pay the same amount. We count. We count. I think it's three ranges. I don't know. It all depends on what the other weight is. If it's four ranges, it's two ranges. It's for sure. It's three ranges. Yeah, three range leads versus two range leads, and the rest is pretty split. Okay, so it passes. So the motion passes. Okay, so we've adopted calendar two. So next year the school year will start after Labor Day. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next action item, which is a, the signing of the warrants, and we're all here, which is terrific. And um, by advice of Brian and Woodson, we are going to do this by a. Um, a roll call, uh, roll call a very slow one. A very I slow. No, I have to take because you have to take notes. A very slow roll call vote. Okay, so let's start back up here. Can we can we do can we take down my sheet? Oh sure. Okay. okay. So your sheet is different. Okay. You have a copy of no, I need I need to check this. Okay, let's start with Deborah Ladd. Uh, well, first, I need a motion to adopt someone. Okay. What Second, Kayla. Budget. Okay. Warrant. The budget warrants. The budget warrants. I okay. think is there, Roxanne, is there something she needs to she needs to read something for this yes. right, mm -hmm. right here? Whole paragraph. Yeah. I wish you give me that so I can Actually, uh Chris, you have to read this motion. As, as I move that the vote entitled vote to call and approve the warrants for the budget meeting in the budget validation referendum and to authorize the notice of amounts adopted be approved in the form presented to this meeting and that a copy of said vote be included with the minutes of this meeting. Vote to call and approve the warrants for the budget meeting and the budget validation referendum and to authorize the notice of amounts adopted. Voting that the warrant for the ranging school unit number 78, the open quote, ranging school unit, close quote, close correct, budget meeting presented to the meeting to be approved and that a regional school unit budget meeting be called for June 7th, 2022 for the purpose of voting on the annual budget for the Rangeley School Unit for the 2022 to 2023 fiscal year. That the warrant and notice of election for the Rangeley School Unit budget validation referendum presented to the meeting be approved and that a regional school unit budget validation referendum be called for June 14, 2022 for the purpose of approving the budget adopted at the Rangeley School Unit budget meeting for the 2022-2023 fiscal year and considering whether to continue the budget validation referendum process. 
and that the form of notice of amounts adopted at budget meeting presented to this meeting be approved and that the superintendent of school of the regional school unit be authorized and directed to complete said notice in accordance with the regional school unit budget meeting on June 7th, 2022, and to cause copies of said notice as completed to be delivered to the municipal clerks of each municipality of the regional school unit for posting at the polling places for the June 14th, 2022 regional school unit budget validation referendum. A true copy is adopted by majority school board attested will be by Georgia Campbell secretary. And we're going to copy of that, so we can get that in there. And we had a second. Kayla, you seconded that motion. Okay, thank you. So we're going to do the roll call vis a vis Georgia's list, starting with Deborah Lamb. Yes, Madam Steen. Yes. Chris Farmer. Aye. Karen Seaman. Aye. Kayla Alexander. Aye. Wes Dugan. Aye. Kathleen Petrini. Yes. Johanna Ferrar. Aye. Amber Haley. Aye. Joan Dunlap. Aye. Joanne Taylor. Aye. And Mary Richards. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So now we sign them now, Roxanne. Yes. Yes. So on all these forms, you all have to sign every form on the same line. Correct. Right. Oh, so Otherwise, <laughs> let's do it last. Or <laughs> we can it's up to you. You, can see, see, you can't mess it up. You laughed, but we had to do this twice one year yes. because yes. Uh, I feel bad. There's 60 pages, so. Yeah. I'm just going to I guess I'm going to all the policies at once. Shall we make something good for dinner, Seth? I don't know. So, <laughs> dinner, I think it would be a better yeah, I'm right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm right there. Can we do all the policies at one Oh, that one was tight, too, right? Huh? That one was not tight. Everybody signing in blue? Okay, I tried not to. 
Well, keep my attention span for 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it off with my pen and it looks worse. Don't worry. 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 I can take care of that. Oh, you need to check that word. Yeah, yeah. No, mine is not the same as it was when I started. Come on, guys. A little more oversight at the beginning, please. How are we doing, Roxanne? You're on the home stretch? On the home stretch. Thank you, guys. I haven't read everything we're signing. We're not making any friends tonight. I think we're signing the budget. They should have put these for doctors. Hey, Roxanne. <laughs> she said there was six <laughs> days. Oh, okay. I don't want to Thank you. Feeling left out. Yeah. Going? I really yeah. want to read all those chats. One hundred percent. Not say anything. Unless something gets in the way that I don't expect, but. <laughs> It's like it's going to be it's 52. It's going to be more you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of these and sign them out. Please don't. I'll notice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Showers like partly sitting behind your own good eyes. Yeah. be showers in rain. Showers in the morning? Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Yeah. Water breathe inside. Who's monitoring that side? Yeah, I think I think it's like, uh, I thought Kim Miller was rain and sunny. Like, what is that? I had to pick up the other day. Is that water breathe supposed to be outside? I thought it was. I think so. Did you want to do this? I don't know what town meeting is. Now it's already decided. It should be a good time. 
push the mix against the weather, but these weekends this year. Are they doing the fun? I do think Dallas and St. Louis are going to be turning Yeah. Yeah. She's mad at me because I told her I didn't want to fill out a W2. Oh, that's true. I can't wait. She got mad. I said, I don't want to do any of this stuff with Dallas. I can, I like both ways. Right. I like both ways. It's 50. I tried to tell her, I said, by the time I do all the like things, like, no, it's no, and then put it with my tax next winner, I'm actually getting paid negative. I'm trying to get it. I wonder. I'm trying to get it. 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 You don't need a 1099. It's under 600. Yeah, under 600. You don't need a We are employed by the, the we are employed by the district while we're signing these, so you are subject to uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we used to get W2s when we were we don't, we don't get paid for being on the board. I know, but that doesn't mean we still aren't covered under work that's comp. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, still so fall off. Yeah. We, we, at the mountain, we used to cover the volunteer ski patrollers were covered under workman's comp without being compensated. Oh, Joanne, it must be special because you and I did things. God, no, we are special. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> oh, you guys get paid by from Rangeley? I actually think we did in Rangeley the first year I was on it, but something happened. Well, I think you could pay too for Rangeley Plantation. We did Rangeley Plantation, guys. for now. It's taken out of the budget, but you, you guys decided to pay out. Oh, we told me all She said we didn't say it. Is it in the Bible? It is. It's in the Bible. I think it was because it said something. Yeah, it is in the Bible. 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 Yeah, it is in
Would it be appropriate for me to move into the yes. action yes. items? Yes, we do. And you yes. guys, even though you're having to sign, could be with us. We can move that. Yes. yes. Let's move then to um, Kathy. You're going to be on uh, action item 10.3 motion to adopt policy BHC entitled board relationships and communication with staff. This is one of the two policies that addresses um, the board's legal responsibility to meet the obligation of the October 18th law. It's a required policy. It is required. And um, I was just going to say, um, why don't we do BHC and KBA together? Yes, together. I agree. Uh, and you can explain it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the, the first policy is a recommended policy by MSMA. It speaks specifically to board and superintendent communication and relationships. It speaks to board and principal relationships. And then it speaks specifically to board, teacher, and other school employees. So it essentially um, addresses how the board and the superintendent, principal, and staff communicate with one another. What is the procedural protocol for that to occur? That addresses part of the obligation of boards to be effective communicators, but it doesn't specifically speak to how the board communicates with public, with the public. So that's why we also um, did a search and found policy E N E B N K B A. K B A. Yeah, the code K B A, which speaks more directly to public information and how boards directly address that. And of course, that's been our goal number one, uh, given that it was it was triggered or precipitated by the fact that the legislature passed this law back in October. Um, but also because we were uh, working on tooling up more effective communication between the board and the school and the community. And as a result, we've seen a lot of uh, tremendous improvement thanks to Sean's leadership and with input from the administration about uh, on the website. We also now have print materials. I, I hope you're noticing letters uh, or, or articles in the Highlander about our board meetings. So for folks who are, who are not technically savvy, but are print oriented, that addresses that need. And then of course, we're doing a whole bunch of other, other things in this area. So these two policies together uh, meet that requirement of the law. So I need a motion to adopt those two policies. Chris, second. Okay, Kathy, uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to the school volunteer agreement. Um, that is, um, I oh, I'm sorry, did I miss no. a skip over yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the two together. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, we did the two together. Yeah, we did the two together. So we're doing J for the physical restraint and seclusion. Oh, I don't have that one in here. Uh, IJ. Uh, no, IJOCE is the next one that's yeah. on. School volunteer agreement. Item. And I'd like to do that together with, um, I guess we can't because we have to adopt that. It, it, all that is is um, a form that when we have volunteers, it's a form to uh, have a copy of it. Uh, and we need to, we don't, we didn't have one before, so we'd like to adopt that form so that uh, when somebody wants to volunteer, they can show it. It was, and uh, just to update you all, um, I believe one of the reasons that we tabled this too is there was some discussion around fingerprinting um, at the last meeting and, and the school covering the cost for that. Well, that was um, IJOC. Oh, I'm sorry. That was that IJOC. No, we're doing both well, on the action items. IJOC comes first. And that's an adoption because we're adopting it. Yeah. And it's just it's adopting a form. That's all it is. So it's just, it's just the form that the person who wants to volunteer signs. Yeah. Okay. And then can I have a motion to adopt this policy? Yeah. Second, Kayla. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Now we're moving on to physical restraint. Physical restraint and seclusion, which is. Um, 
I, uh, that's a required JAAA. It's a required policy. And um, there were so many new changes in that policy that I went to um, the NSNA's policy and we decided rather than go through the whole policy and make all those little changes, we just sort of uh, I decided to adopt NSNA's verbatim. It was easier, simple. Um, and that is um, and the re oh I see and the reason we we table this is because it's required that's why we decided to go with their version verbatim but the reason we had tabled it was because um, ours was different than NSNS so we decided for practical reasons really to go with their version. And, uh, yeah, okay, so Kathy, it's a required policy. We decided we we the committee double checked that everything that was covered in our old policy is covered in the new policy. But in addition, no, we actually removed some of the things that were in our oh, old okay. policy. But then so there were changes. For yeah. People. So because there were so many changes, we decided to just accept the MSN version, which is the required version. Today. And I have a motion to um, adopt. Second. Okay. Uh, Kira, uh, any questions or discussion on this policy? Seeing none. All those in favor. Okay. Now the um, IJOC two <coughs> volunteers was tabled at the last board meeting because of objections to the new wording inserted by MSNA. Um, and then this was the one with the defense and everything. Mm -hmm. So, so um, we, re we reviewed it again. And um, the cost of background and the problem was cost of background checks and right. um, fingerprinting, which would be minimal, according to Georgia, uh, since it would only apply to a volunteer who would be with a student alone, which is not frequent. So it would not be, it would not affect us financially. I mean, it's $15, Rita. Edu so I checked into it, into this. Educate Maine is looking to remove the cost of this. They're working with DOE to do that. And in the meantime, the district will cover the cost of this. And then we'll have the cost of the That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Great. So may I have a motion to so move. Yeah. Second. Second. Johanna. Okay. Uh, any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Now we're at physical restraint. Um, no, we are trying to use the four. That was one. Four. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I'm with you now. Designs policy JLF. Looking at my notes. So JLF is Child Abuse Reporting Prevention and Education. Uh, it was also on MSNA's list of revised policies. And my bad, I accidentally overlooked it. So when I realized that, um, I compared it, I compared ours to MSNA's. And there were some rewordings on the definitions and also a couple of other additions. So we decided instead to do what we did with the other policy is to kind of check ours and um, use the MSMA version verbatim. And that, that just comes as a relief because a lot of it was the same, but there was just a lot of insertions here, there, and everywhere. So yeah, um, some substantial changes. Yeah, so it's essentially just a revision of the old policy. Can I have a motion to have a second? Yes. Okay, Kayla. Uh, any questions, comments, or discussion? All those in favor? And the next one um, was to rescind JGAA, which we tabled at the last board meeting. Uh, we had, we, we had, we didn't, I don't think we reviewed it. I have formulated an opinion. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, so many very 
variations on this thing, but uh, it was decided that um, we it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, it's it's really about it's about five year olds that enroll that may be placed in first grade. We already do that if we need to. It's not a required policy, so it's not required, and it doesn't really apply. So, so may I have a motion to rescind policy? JGAA. So moved. Karen, can I have a second? Johan. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Can I ask a procedural question? Kathy, did we vote on um, school volunteers? Yes. Yes. We did. So we didn't skip over the policy itself. It's not the policy. No, yeah. we did the volunteer. Yeah. The agreement we needed to adopt. Okay, that's why these are out of order. And the uh, um, volunteer policy needs to be revised. So, um, I just wanted to update everybody on the GCPA. Um, although you um, you approved it at the last meeting, there was a discussion about the rate of pay for long term subs. I think if I understood your question correctly, yes. Ravana, you wanted me to check into that. Um, so I did. I reached out to several districts um, to see sort of what they do. They they're doing the same thing as we are. They put their their uh, long term sub um, at the zero teacher scale in the contract, um, and that rate of pay is about three dollars an hour more than the daily rate that we that we approved. Um, so it is higher. Um, it's about twenty dollars a day, so it would be about two hundred and twenty dollars. And after ten days, they are entitled to um, health benefits. Yes. Yep. Yep. And I I will be reviewing those on an annual basis. Those rates. So oh, and I also want to say that because of that, because we we increased that. Rate of pay, we did um, get a teacher sub in our building that's subbing now daily for us. So, thank you. I that. Listen, just a quick reminder we follow those policies that we just went through is the policy for the value, the process for the evaluation superintendent, as well as her job description. And please take a look at those before you do the evaluation for. I would really appreciate that. Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a second. <laughs> All in favor. <laughs> Thank you. Two and a half hours. Enjoy your summer. Make motion. Thank you.